Hello, I'm Nicola Martin. I'm Professor of Social Justice and Inclusive Education at London South Bank University. But really, I'm just a jumped up disability advisor and head of disability services. So my focus is on working together with colleagues from professional services just to make inclusive learning a reality in higher education. So universal design for learning is an approach that underpins the whole idea of inclusive learning in higher education. It's based on planning for a diverse university community rather than being surprised by diversity and then attempting to retrofit adjustments for people who don't conform to this mythical norm stereotype, which doesn't actually um, respond to anything in reality. Um, I'm not going to read out the whole slide but you have got all these available to you. But underneath in yellow is a definition from CAST, which is um, where universal design for learning originated. But it's just about planning for everybody and doing joined up thinking, which is something that we are very good at in professional services. But in my experience, which spans several universities, the um, professional services academic divide can be a bit of a problem in that professional services colleagues are not often asked to sit around the table when researching the student experience, which I think is a fundamental problem person. So universal design for learning, why, what and how? It's about multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation and multiple means of action and expression, which is breathtakingly obvious really, because multiple means of engagement gives learners with different learning styles, different re learning requirements, the opportunity to engage with learning. Multiple means of representation is about providing um, learning in different ways and enabling people to respond to learning in different ways. So it's not all having the same assignment to do in exactly the same way. It's responsive to people's different requirements so that learning can be demonstrated in various ways. And we're really good at, good at this as disability practitioners and we make recommendations around this all the time, but it only really works effectively if we can sit around the table when courses are validated. So we're talking about how's this course being assessed again? You know, can we have a menu of assessments? If you have a menu of assessments and the student can select from that menu, then they're not going it reduces the requirement for reasonable adjustments, which we all know is on the agenda in relation to the disabled student experience. So um, I was involved in this research project with a group of people who you'll recognise are all disability advisors in one form or another or have been. So this project was called Implementing Inclusive Teaching and Learning in UK HE utilising universal design for learning as a route to excellence and we obviously taken as a route to excellence from the layer report which underpinned this research it was funded by the society for research in higher education which i highly recommend that everybody joins because once you've paid 120 pounds you can go to all the conferences for free and it's really good so was authored by me, Mike Ray, who you, who you will know was at York St John and within the National Disability Team and Widening Participation, Abby James and EA Drafen, who are associated with Southampton but also work beyond that, and Paddy Turner from Sheffield Hallam. And my colleague Joe Crupper was also involved. Joe delivers my access to work support. So Without Joe, I'm effectively a complete wobbly jelly and capable of doing anything. So fantastic to have Joe on board as well. And working together effectively, which is part of the theme of this talk across all sorts of geographical boundaries. But we manage because we're basically on the same page. And I'd say, thinking about our colleagues in NADP, we're all on the same page too. Okay, so the aims of this study were to outline an approach to delivering inclusive practice within courses to mitigate the risks identified by layer. This is the um, funder speak that we had to use. To understand how disabled students experience the teaching and learning environment, including assessment at every stage of the journey from pre-entry to post-exit, 
including how they interact with every aspect of student services, professional services, admissions, etc, etc. And then we looked at a small representative cross-section of UK universities in relation to this. And then another study that followed on, I replicated this with a small cross-section of American universities. And I've got a paper in press about that, which I've no doubt you'll get to see at some point. And we did a sort of case study approach effectively. OK, so this um, image, you might be familiar with this image, it's a triangle. And at the pointy end, it says DSA. Below it, the third below it, which is a sort of fatter part of the triangle as it goes towards the base, says individual reasonable adjustments. And then the broad base at the bottom, the bottom third, says about an inclusive learning environment. Again, reinforcing that message of universal design, the more inclusive the learning environment is, the more um, likely a diverse range of students will access it and the more likely you are to comply with our requirements underneath the um, Equality Act, which obviously in our profession we're incredibly familiar with, but I wouldn't say that that is a ubiquitous understanding throughout every institution. And Equality Act requirements, we find ourselves all the time having to bang on about them and sometimes the argument made in business case terms appeals more to people who are holding the purse strings, if you like. So this idea of reducing reasonable adjustments is a sort of um, appeals to the business people. But always throughout this report, we made the point some students will need some bespoke arrangements, but that reduces that requirement as the framework is much more of a solid foundation for all students. OK, so this is the abstract from the SRHE report, which I'll just read out. The UK HE sector is undertaking reforms to the disabled students allowance. Until recently, the primary means of funding support for eligible disabled students. Operation of DSA is slightly different in Scotland, but the same principles apply. In a government commission report, embedding universal design for learning and inclusive practice was proposed as an approach to reducing reliance on DSA. This research examines the circumstances in which UDL is currently operating in a cross section of English universities with a view to contributing to a current patchy evidence base, focus groups, interviews, questionnaires were utilised to collect data from um, disability support staff, university academics and so on. Um, pockets of good practice such as inclusive virtual learning environments were identified and it's noted that such strategies benefit all students rather than just those who've been entitled to DSA. Strategic engagement and embedding UDL was thought to require joined up thinking between various staff groups under the direction of a named senior leader. Participants suggested this did not happen coherently. Students felt that systems in place to support their learning were hard to navigate. Some staff were surprised at not communicating about this as effectively as they thought. A sector wide benchmark doesn't currently exist and would be helpful to create a stronger foundation for this work. So nothing there would surprise anybody who works in professional services, particularly in disability services, but um, it's we operate in our bubble we're all talking to each other and it's a mistake to think that this applies across the whole of the university this level of understanding and you know that we know this we know this okay so there's some overarching themes disabled and disadvantaged students and some staff don't necessarily know what support is available at university and that's quite interesting actually that presenting to staff saying you know, students can access support from the library, support from skills for learning team, disability support, mental health support, etc. And, and university academic staff were saying things like, we didn't realise that was available. And that's because nobody really put it into the induction for staff. And it's as if they're supposed to imbibe this knowledge through a process of osmosis or um, disability services and other professionals run round trying to make sure everybody knows and this comes right round to joined up thinking, senior leadership etc. So joined up approaches between academic and professional services are rare and professional services staff are seldom included in research around student experience. 
I've done a lot of research around critical disability studies, some of which looks at student experience. And I cast my critical eye over it and I think, hmm, where's the student voice? Nothing about us without us, obviously. But where are the voices also of colleagues in professional services for whom this whole thing is their bread and butter and they've got wisdom to impart? And it feels like it's telling half a story very often. And this is something else that I've written about. And I've got a paper in press in something or other, which you'll, you will get to see. I'll make sure NADP colleagues get to see it. So students in transition do not know enough about what is required of them at university. The staff rarely work together between educational phases. We know this to be true. NADP did a lot of work, particularly with Deb Viney, when Deb was around. Um, in various universities, we would, and when we had widening participation colleagues by our sides as well, we would go, we would target um, year 12 pupils um, and bring them along to events and talk to them and their supporters, who were a bit of a side issue because we talked directly to the students about support available at university. Parents would be there and Almost universally, transition teachers were incredibly surprised about the support available at the university, as were parents, as were the pupils. And I'm sure that puts people off even thinking about university because it's this idea you will never cope, you'll never survive in university. And, and that is really problematic and it became more problematic as widening participation and um, aim higher ceased to be funded and so on. So lack of this information puts students off um, and supporting students starts with aspiration raising and is crucial at the pre-entry stage. And I would say to our widening participation colleagues, aspiration raising starts, you know, in infancy practically. It's if as soon as somebody internalises this othering message, university is not for you, that the damage is done really. So I think that there's an interface that needs strengthening there. So universal design for learning is an approach designed to include all students and minimise the requirements of bespoke reasonable adjustments. UDL views disability and disadvantage through a social model lens, i.e. the university should walk towards the eradication of barriers at all stages in the journey. So it's not about the wrong students, it's about the wrong systems. A widening participation up to the front door is not social justice because, for example, you'll get universities that lower their tariff points. And so if somebody comes in without GCSE maths and is immediately on a module which requires maths above the level of GCSE and they fail that module, who's surprised? Well, you know, we needed to be teaching them some maths in order for them to pass that module because we, in all honesty, knew they didn't have GCSE C-level maths, for example. And then this word in red at the bottom, intersectionality. This thing about multiple disadvantage is really important, particularly in this time of COVID. We've, sh we've really been shining a light on this and everybody's now talking about digital poverty because if you've got a family of five all trying to do their various bits of homeschooling, university courses on one mobile phone, very very different situation from somebody who's in a perfectly equipped home office with all the assistive technology they need and everything else so just thinking the intersection between poverty and other aspects of disadvantage is incredibly important and a real reality for our students and there's a lot of work about the BAME attainment gap or achievement gap which fails to look at the fact a lot of our students from BAME backgrounds are also living in poverty, which means they're working full time while studying and having family responsibilities very often. So it's not, you know, it's not just a factor of BAME heritage, which is not an homogenous thing anyway. It's identity is much more complex than that. And this is something that we know full well because we meet loads of different people from loads of different backgrounds and we're good at not stereotyping people according to any sort of label. And this is something which is pretty fundamental really in terms of inclusive practice. So the reasons for this research, the funding mechanisms to support disabled students have changed. There's a requirement to minimise individual reasonable adjustments, but still know that the Equality Act um, duties are anticipatory in relation to disabled students. So we don't just bung on a sticking plaster later. We need to embed inclusive practice. 
but there's a lack of clarity about how policies and procedures can be actioned in actual practice in our education. And the evaluation of all these processes by stakeholders is pretty difficult without a, a sector wide baseline against which to, to measure and assess these things. OK, so our key findings. UDL relevant to all aspects of the student journey. Well, we could have told you that before doing the research. It's not effectively championed at senior, le senior level and it's not adequately reflected in the TEF metrics. So the teaching excellence framework, which identifies your university as gold, bronze, silver, bronze or provisional, um, that goes out into the public domain. And if the talk about student experience was much more strengthened along UDL lines, it might form part of our baseline and be more of a lever than it is. Although we welcome it, it could, could do better. There's no, you know, as a benchmark, we don't have a benchmark. It's a, it's a crude, isn't it? A sort of crude, like, um, league table type of measure. Like, oh, I'll have a look at that university. They've got gold in the TEF. Mm. So joined up thinking between various roles was identified as important to ensuring that students could access university students, including those which enabled them to develop their academic skills. So sometimes you get disabled students accessing disability services. You think they can't access anything else because they're accessing disability services. But within an entitlement model, they've paid their fees as well, and they're entitled to access skills for learning, library, services whatever it is and those services also need to be anticipatory to be accessible in an anticipatory way and students really did not know how to access services and they felt that they were covered in daunting layers of admin and bureaucracy the dsa um, was criticized heavily for the bureaucratic layers involved but so we're just finding your way around other services because of the lack of a joined up map which was very common. So communication between staff and students and various staff groups was not always as effective as staff thought. And that's so getting together in our research with professional services colleagues and academics and students. And it's as if they were all on a different planet in relation to how they interpreted information. And I'd say things like, oh, this embedded inclusive practice in our, you know, in our courses, da da da. And then somebody from disability services to say, yeah, but that works in your course. It does not work right across the university. Like, for example, we always put things up on Moodle, which is our virtual learning platform in advance. And that's just the ordinary practice in education. But that doesn't mean everybody does. And it's easy to assume that what that the pockets of good practice are the practice across the university and that and the people who know are professional services colleagues, of course, because they're outside their faculty bubble or whatever it is. So academic input was identified as only part of the picture and working together with professional services colleagues was viewed as key, obviously. Technology was valued by staff and students alike and little distinction was made between making use of accessibility functions and using assistive technology. This is incredibly important because not all students have a package of all sorts of assistive technology, but all students can be supported to understand how their computer works so that, they, that it can be as assistive as humanly possible. But in order to support students to do that, staff have to know what about the functionality and those bits of joined up thinking are not necessarily that common. So awareness of available technology and how to use it effectively was identified as important by staff and students, but communication about this was not always affected, effective. So staff and students felt they needed, to, needed input into the practicalities of using the technology. And staff are aware of not making use of all the functions because they didn't really know how to. And for example, you'd have somebody think, I know I've got, I know I must turn the captions on and, I, and you know, I'm on board with it philosophically, but I've no idea which button to press. And I really don't want to say I don't know because I should know because I keep banging on about it, but actually I'm not doing it because I don't know how to do it and I'm embarrassed. And that is a common, common experience. Okay, we've frozen. Oh yeah.
Right, the students found notes in advance on virtual learning platforms helpful, obviously, especially if they're accessible. Practice appeared to be more embedded in widening participation universities, although variation between courses was noted by professional services staff. This argument, oh, it's my academic property, doesn't sit well with the anticipatory duty of the Equality Act and the argument people won't attend if they've got notes in advance. Sort of, um, we're moving along a bit to blended learning and so on and asynchronous lectures. So that argument has to be cognizant of that change. The, you know, the world is changing in that respect. So recording lectures was viewed as an entitlement for students, particularly for staff, for staff in widening participation contexts. But students who felt that routine access could not be assumed found this disappointing. Students should not have to say to lecturers, can I record this lecture? Especially when everybody's recording it on their mobile phone anyway. Time with helpful understanding, well-informed staff was highly valued by students, but staff expressed frustration about the demands on their time because some academics are completely rushed off their feet and sometimes they are talking to students about stuff which the library staff are better equipped to deal with, for example, but if the, but the student didn't know the library staff would sit down and tell them how to do referencing, and so the academics doing it, and that's because of lack of joined up thinking, lack of communicating with each other. And in widening participation universities, staff acknowledge that students require detailed study skills input, at least initially, discuss plans to embed this more fully in order to help students develop their academic skills and learn autonomy. And we'll give you an example of something that we did at, at South Bank where I work. Um, widening participation staff were really keen on formative assessment, which helped students to identify their own academic, current academic skills and, and requirements in terms of developing these skills and really wanted to put something like that in place if it wasn't there already. And this is just a little um, diagram saying, as disabled students afford, or are disabled students afforded flexibility and access to the curriculum UK HE courses as suggested by Universal Design for Learning? or are there barriers to implementation? And some of the barriers, perceived barriers, difficult to implement, time consuming, requires more work beyond my remit and lack of UDL knowledge. And that really sort of speaks for itself, I think. Okay, these are examples of some disconnects which came up in some of our focus groups. So a student, services are not available when I'm at university as dyslexia support is only open in the daytime and my course sessions are 4.30 after work. Staff in Skills for Learning team, we can make evening appointments for students. Course director, we had no idea you could do that. So it just shows how we're not necessarily talking to each other. Another example, Skills for Learning team. We've done loads of work on making resources to help students with academic writing, including short screenshots, worksheets for planning essays and all sorts of stuff like that. Course director, we had no idea about this or where to find these resources staff disability contact. We have annual evaluations of our service and something that comes up is that students say that lecturers don't always seem to know about their support plans. So again, joined up thinking, okay? And some positives. Uh, the staff disability contact said all student computers have Claro Read. Yay, brilliant. Staff course director, we have a lead for ICT on our team. She could do with knowing about Clara Reed so she could tell the rest of the team. Mm, hard to promote it if you don't know it's there. And a lecturer. We have a student with visual impairment who's really good at telling us how she wants materials presented. She makes it easy. We send stuff to her in advance in accessible format and she reformats it. Nothing about us without us, student autonomy, etc. Students. Our lecturers put everything on Moodle in advance and it's really helpful. Our lecturer went through the um, assignment questions point by point. That was really helpful. So, you know, just typical examples, really. DSA assessment obviously requires sensitivity to personal and institutional context. So a first year undergraduate student may well not have the same requirements as a doctoral student and everything in between. Prior educational experience is obviously relevant. Looking on university websites is a good starting point for DSA assessments, but it's really great if you can actually talk to somebody who understands the course, like the course director. 
And when I used to do DSA assessments, we had that was one of our like tick list things that we actually had to do that. And I don't know the extent that that happens now because I've been out of that world for a long time. So students are still entitled to access all the university services, even if they did get DSA, but they don't always realise it. And I advocate in DSA assessment reports, thinking about self-esteem, thinking about the bigger picture and actually telling students that within the context of the report. And our research revealed that finding a joined up map of services was so difficult in most universities. We looked at websites, we went, you know, mystery shoppered to student services desk and said, have you got a joined up map of all your services? And they said, well, I don't think we have, that'd be a good idea. That happened all the time. Maybe a DSA funded mentor could help the students navigate between the different systems. And in DSA reports, sometimes you see people talk about transitions being really important. But one big thing is the transition out and where there is lack of joined up thinking, I think, is the segue between DSA and access to work funding and the level of understanding by people who work in the career service and the alumni people about access to work and things like that, because the Equality Act means that disabled students have equal entitlement to those services, but they sort of fall off a bit in terms of being accessible and, um, you know, thinking in an anticipatory way about the requirements of disabled students. So this talking to each other in transition with the student at the heart of it, obviously pretty important. OK, this is a little bit of stuff about cultural, social, symbolic, economic, I'd say academic capital. Pierre Bourdieu talks about forms of capital, one of them being academic capital. And students don't all start at the same point. And it's really important not to make assumptions about the level of academic understanding a student has about what university is going to be like. And just keeping that in mind all the time is really important and not tra trashing people's self-esteem by making assumptions they understand things which are completely outside of their prior experience because they weren't brought up with two graduate parents surrounded in books etc etc so udl might reduce reliance on DLA, dsa but will not eliminate the requirement for bespoke reasonable adjustment so one, think about students whose academic grounding is not steeped in the principles of understanding university. Think how you're going to meet their requirements. Think about the requirements of students for whom a UDL basis is a really good, inclusive practice is really good, but they need more. And that more is usually delivered by the DSA. Also think about the students who can't access DSA and also need more, which, and that is quite a hot potato. Um, this thing about joined up access and all the services is, is important. Equality Act is important. And I say self-esteem is incredibly important because you can really trash people's self-esteem without meaning to very easily. We are really good at not doing that. I think DSA assessments need to big up what a student has achieved as well as talking about their requirements to achieve what they need to achieve more. OK. So this is a little, um, I'm just looking at the time. I don't think it goes off at half past, nearly finished. The reference for this is, is at the end. This is an article that was in the Journal of Inclusive Practice in Further and Higher Education. This is the abstract. A pre-entry self-assessment protocol was developed by academics and professional services staff with input from students at London South Bank University, trialled with a cohort of undergrads in education. The purpose was to help the students to identify the practical and academic skills they'd need to develop in order to succeed and understand the sort of support that would be available to help them. By completing the exercise, the students could develop a personal action plan and the exercise also linked to a joined up map of services. And this is what the students said about it. Develop their sense of belonging. It was comforting and reassuring to get this guidance. They felt they weren't on their own because they knew what support was available. What staff said about it, it encouraged student agency. Students were aware of areas of confidence and areas of need, and students were independently accessing services. So I'll just read one of the quotes. You think, oh, am I really ready for uni? Am I going to be able to finish it? But then when you know there's things out there that can help you, it gives you that confidence to take the step to better yourself. But know there's always help in case you have difficulties. And that's what we're trying to achieve in terms of communication with students. 
COVID is obviously our challenge. Is this the moment to embed universal design for learning? Because suddenly we're all experts in distance learning, delivery and everything else. And things that were notionally impossible suddenly are possible because it's, uh, what is it? Um, something about necessity is the mother of invention. So thinking about how the COVID, COVID moment is impacting on us. And then just a few discussion points. How does UDL benefit non-disabled students? How can we avoid putting students off the idea of university? What do we need to help students prepare for universities? And right back to the theme of working together, how can we do joined up thinking to move beyond widening participation up to the front door to a fully inclusive university based on principles of universal design where everybody talks to each other. We work as a team with the student at the heart of the team. And there's few resources here, including the Ledley Mead paper, which you can get off NADP website. If you go to the journals and it's um, that the reference for it is there. So that's me. I think there's time for questions and I think I have to stop the recording now. So I hope this doesn't hasn't come out as a complete dog's breakfast because it's the first time I've done it without Lynn holding my hand. And thank you to Lynn for showing me how to do it. And if this is rubbish, blame Lynn. Thank you very much.